Welcome to Denver Startup Week. I'm Ben Data, co-chair of DSW. This year marks the 10 year anniversary of Denver Startup Week. This community has been the catalyst for lots of change over the past decade. And this week we're coming together to celebrate the past and dream big for the future. We are able to bring Denver Startup Week to this community thanks to our 2021 sponsors. Thank you to our HQ and title sponsor, Amazon, and our title sponsors whose leadership makes this week come to life. Capital One Cafe, Downtown Denver Partnership, Fluid Truck, Hotel Engine, and WeWork. And our track sponsors, who have made all of the great content you're hearing today possible. Founder Track, Kickstart, Growth Track, Friday Health Plans, Developer Track, Quizlet, Product Track, Palantir, Designer Track, Battery 621 in the Public Works, People Track, Exactly, and Spotlight Event Sponsor, Strat Labs. Our headline event sponsors are bringing the excitement this week. Thank you to B-Side Fund, Colorado Public Radio, Comcast, Coors Brewing Company, Denver Pavilions, Entrepreneurship at the University of Denver, Gusto, J.P. Morgan Chase, Method, Moss Adams, Pine Insurance, Promontory Mortgage Path, Red Bull Basement, Southwest, Tattered Cover, and VF Venture Foundry. Finally, thank you to our partner and member sponsors listed on the screen. Please say thank you to these companies as you enjoy our Hybrid Denver Startup Week. And don't forget to use hashtag Den Startup Week to share your experience and moments of inspiration on social media. Have a great week. Insert strategy. Hello everyone, welcome to Denver Startup Week. I'm John, the Spotlight Track Chair and member of the Denver Startup Week Organizing Committee. Thank you for joining us for the 10th anniversary of Denver Startup Week. At Denver Startup Week, we strive to make all of our sessions a space where attendees can connect, learn, and grow, regardless of age, gender identity, gender expression, race, ability, or sexual orientation. A special thank you to our sponsors for their support in helping us keep DSW free and accessible for all. Thank you for joining us, and have a great week. I am becoming every single thing I promised I would never be and I am always in the night wondering if one day I'll ever see that I can stop making excuses regardless of how depression seems. Struggling to find a gap of who I am and who I'm trying to be. Struggle to convince my mama that I still got time to see. Nathan, what you trying to do? What schools are you applying to? Honestly, I'm not even convinced. The college is the move through these beats. I feel the groove and vibe on these verses. Curses, I'm nervous. Can't the surface a few souls that have heard this. Claiming I'm a rapper makes me a stereotypical black boy who ain't athletic. So he had to settle with that rap noise because you a real nigga. Unless you want to be an Oreo, you wasn't made for other things. And that's just how the story goes. Ain't doing what they doing. So I couldn't be black preconceived identities just to hold ourselves back damn i'm whack life is crap they won't clap i feel trapped pretty rattled by my future and i hate all of my past and they like nathan just do you and i'm sure that's a great plan but how i'm supposed to do me if i don't know who i am i am becoming every single thing i promise i would never be and i am always in an eye one and if one day i'll ever see that i can Stop making excuses regardless of how the pressure sink is my plans to plant these seeds so you can wait and watch me grow way up into a better me. I am becoming every single thing I promised I would never be and I am always in the night wondering if one day I'll ever see that I can. Stop making excuses regardless of how the pressure sink because my plants to plant these seeds so you can wait and watch me grow way up into a better me. Hey, Nathan, just had a revelation. You've been having conversations about decisions you've been making and not to be cold, but this is getting kind of old, throwing doubt up in your soul when all you got is gold. Your mind's the biggest trap in the world and it stinks because everything you do causes you to overthink thoughts of positivity with the negative rebuttals, trying to convince yourself you're sinking when you're standing in a puddle 
puddle. I know that life's a puzzle. I know you got your struggles. Keep going through your struggles. You'll be growing through your struggles. I promise you'll go make it. I know that you'll go live. Forget that I ain't that I can't. Just let yourself win. Go ahead and let yourself live. Go ahead and let yourself be. There ain't a man out there like you. You gotta let yourself breathe. Forget the lies and stuff about why you won't succeed. You got your will, you got your life, you got your love, you plant the seeds and you'll say, I am way better than I say I is. And I am done treating myself like this. And I won't be my own antagonist in any situation, baby. Nathan got a plan for this. No, God, he got a plan for this. God, he got a plan for this. God, he got a plan for this. I'm gonna keep on going and going, keep on growing and growing. Have some seeds, now they trees, greatest me, going showing like. Hi, I'm Nathan Zonga. Nathan, <laughs> give it up, everyone. Oh, wow. And also the interpretation. I mean, <laughs> that was just amazing. Thank you so much, Nate. I'm so happy you're on this panel and I'm going to introduce you so everyone knows a bit more about you. Um, thank you all so much for being here and joining today. I, um, I am Elizabeth Neufeld, and I am the CEO and founder of Strat Labs. It looks like uh, we have a small group here on the Zoom call, but apparently there's a much larger group on the YouTube, so that's awesome. And if you all on the YouTube have questions or comments or things that you um, would like to relate to us, you can either hop on the Zoom and put it in the chat, and that goes for all of you on the chat as well. Or you are also um, welcome to send a text and I could try to, to read that during um, and I will put my phone number in the um, chat so you can have that. Uh, and I'll do that in just a second. So like I said, I'm Elizabeth Neufeld. I'm the CEO and founder of Strat Labs. Strat Labs is a social impact and communications agency here in Denver. And we work exclusively with social enterprises and entrepreneurs that are driven by mission. I have been working in the social impact space for over 20 years, and I have a real passion for this and really want to better understand and tell the stories of social entrepreneurs. I'm dedicated to advancing the missions of these individuals and the organizations that they work with through strategy, marketing, and public relations. A little fun fact about me was that when I was 10 years old, which is the same age as my old, oldest kid right now, I started an organization called Caring About Kids Everywhere, Cake. I think that our biggest accomplishment was the name, um, but I was really able during that time to find a passion for lifting the voices and stories of change makers around the globe. Um, this year, Strat Lab was lucky enough to be a sponsor of the Spotlight Track here in Denver um, for Denver Startup Week. And we chose to sponsor this incredibly valuable event, which during pre-COVID times hosted over 20,000 people at 350 events. And online is doing just as good of a job reaching people globally because of the virtual options. DSW, as we find, fondly call it, is a great example of social entrepreneurship in this, that this week-long event is intended to unite the entrepreneurial community in Denver and beyond now and celebrate great companies, innovation, ideas, and people, all who have the potential to create waves of change in our communities. You know, sometimes it can be really hard to define social entrepreneurship or being a social entrepreneur. And people ask me all the time what it takes to be a social entrepreneur or enterprise. And, and sometimes they'll even say, am I? Is this, is this what I'm doing? I'm not really sure. Um, and my answer is always the same. You know, it comes back to change. So if you're driving toward change, then you are a social entrepreneur. So in the past, you know, I think many entrepreneurs would have an opportunity sometimes to accumulate wealth in the private sector, and then they became philanthropists later in life. But however, <clears throat> now it's more common to see entrepreneurs working to improve social issues through their business. And that makes me really happy. That speaks my language. So, you know, the use of ethical practices such as impact investing, conscious consumerism, and corporate social responsibility really help to support these endeavors and allow leaders to tackle social issues while generating profit for shareholders. So with that, I am really happy to introduce you all to our incredibly talented and empathetic panelists who are change makers in very unique ways. One of them you just heard from. And Nate, if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to introduce yourself and tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Nathan Zonga. 
I'm a singer, songwriter, love advocate, number one. I'm a love advocate first, and I'm an artist. And um, yeah, I'm from Seattle, Washington, and 22 years old. And um, I've been making music for like for as long as I can remember. But um, yeah, I've been working with uh, Lizzie and Strat Labs for the past year because we put out a short film last. Uh, we put out a short film in like January or February, and we've been working on. Um, We've been working on getting it out there for folks. And uh, yeah, I like making music about empowering people and uplifting people. And uh, if you want to be a successful artist, you have to be a successful entrepreneur as well. So I'm just sort of kind of learning and trying to link those two together right now. I'm here to learn as much as I'm here to talk, I guess. Thank you, Nate. You are awesome. And you are a social entrepreneur in the truest sense um, in so many different ways. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Diane Miles. Would you like to go and tell us a little bit about yourself? And yeah. Hi, my name is Diane Miles and I am the founder and CEO of Dope Mom Life. Um, I don't know, is there any spe anything specific you want us to talk about? But just what Dope Mom Life does and what you do and yeah, how you found yourself onto this panel. Yeah, um, I'm, well, you, <laughs> <laughs> you're how I got here. Um, I do a lot of different things, but as far as Dope Mom Life goes, we are a creative content agency that specializes in video production, community relationship building, engagement and outreach and ambassador marketing. And all of the work that we do is through a diversity, equity, inclusion and an anti-racism lens with the community first, um, the community first approach. Um, so, yeah. That's, That's great. Who we are. And That's Diane it. is also on the, the committee, the organizing committee, and is a chair for DSW Startup Week. So uh, I should say Denver Startup Week. That doesn't make sense. Um, and has, has been volunteering to do all this and just putting her incredible talents toward this effort. So we have a lot of thanks to give for, for you dedicating that time to make Denver Startup Week happen. All right, Jeannie, you're up next. I'm just going to my grid. <laughs> There we go. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeannie Renee Malone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today, Lizzie. Um, so I head up global sustainability at VF Corporation. Um, VF recently moved to Denver. Well, it's actually been about two years now. We are one of the world's largest apparel, footwear, and accessories companies. Um, we like to say we connect people to lifestyles, activities, and experience through our family of iconic outdoor, active, and workwear brands, including Vans, the North Face, Timberland, Smartwell, and Dickies. And as I mentioned, I lead the sustainability function. So I'm responsible for driving the company's environmental initiatives, goals, strategies, and actions. And this really gives me the opportunity to work across the entire enterprise with, with social entrepreneurs in many ways. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, I am also from Seattle, Washington. I'm so excited that I share that with you, Nathan. It gives me a lot of pleasure. Um, and I have spent my entire career focused on sustainability. And when I think about sustainability, it truly is that interconnection of people and the planet. So environmental stewardship and social responsibility. And I'm so proud to have spent my career trying to really create a better place from an environmental perspective and to create benefits for the people around us. Love it. Thank you so much, Jeannie. That's wonderful. Uh, Alicia, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, my name is Elisa McKenzie. I am located in the Washington, D.C. area, so I live just outside of Georgetown, and I am the founder of Lift Like a Mother, which is a health and wellness company dedicated to uh, teaching women how to integrate healthier habits into their lifestyle. So I think we've found that health and wellness is um, very privileged in the sense that 
you think everybody has access to the same foods and you think everybody has access to the same gyms and the same recreational spaces. When I, I work with a client, let's say she doesn't have a gym in walking distance and she only has a set of dumbbells in her house. And the only food that she has is uh, five miles away. She has to get into her car and drive to go get it. It's just teaching people how to work with the resources that they have available to them. So that's kind of my, my bread and butter. And then I also run a health and wellness nonprofit where I am able to partner with corporations such as Lululemon to kind of bring the social community aspect to their fitness events. So for example, we just did a run in DC and everybody that was running was supposed to bring food to which that, uh, we then donated to one of our local partnership organizations. So it's just figuring out how you can partner with these fitness events now that things are starting to come back more in person and just adding kind of that social community aspect to it. So um, I guess I same, same as Nate, I found my way here through Lizzie. Uh, we worked with her um, last year during the pandemic when, the, when my nonprofit was kind of getting started to figure out how I wanted to do this whole social entrepreneurship thing. Um, I have the resources, I have the time. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my story. Thank you so much. All right, Nicole, you're up. Last but not least. Um, hi, my name is Nicole Bagley, and I'm an angel investor that invests mostly in women and impact. And I didn't always start out that way. I didn't start out that way. I started with just investing, but I realized that women really needed, um, startup money. And um, it was a lot harder for women to get that money. So that's where I focused. And I'm also the president of the SAPLA Foundation, which focuses on social and racial justice issues and environmental protection and justice in the state of Georgia. And we give away about $1.5 million a year. But in the last few years, we have been sort of more aligning our values with our investments and using the whole 100%. And um, we started to invest in PRIs um, through uh, community financial institutions and have been fairly successful and we're ready to, you know, we sort of um, have been moving in that direction slowly, but we're ready to sort of take a bigger leap now since we've started. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nicole. And thank you all for being here. And, and to, um, to the people out there, thank you for showing up. We're excited to kind of dive into this content. So I guess first up, I would love to ask each of you panelists, what, um, how do you define social entrepreneurship, either, you know, to yourself or when you speak to people? I know that each of you has a different version of this in your own work, um, and it looks differently for each of you, which is why we've brought you all together. So it would be great if you could just kind of go and tell us, you know, a definition or explanation of what you've curated as your version of social entrepreneurship. Um, Diane, do you want to start? Not to put you on the spot. Actually, anyone can. Again. <laughs> Sorry about that. You're in my grid. You're number one. <laughs> and yeah, I'll let somebody else start. I'll start, uh, I'll start. I mean, to me, it means it is um, if you start a company, you're trying to solve a problem um, first and foremost. And, you know, I often say there's no crime in making money, but the objective is first is to solve that problem and then to make money. And if you can do both at the same time, then that is great. But it's almost like disrupting a, disrupting a system. Love that. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll jump in. I just, I think that um, similar to what, uh, was it Nicole was just saying that uh, you actually have to provide value, not just make noise. Right. So are you actually providing value? Are you actually solving a problem? Or are you just being performative, making noise, and then closing the computer and going about your business? Yeah. We had we had a client this week that um, named it as authentic ROI, which I really loved. Um, yeah, I thought that was good. Anyone else? I can jump in. Um... I think I, I really love those two definitions so far and just building on that, you know, I, from the, the corporate perspective, which is a little bit different, um, 
that are others on the call today, you know, we really think about our business purpose and tied to our, you know, how we create value through our business. And that's so important to us. And so our commitment to sustainability, which is what I focus on, is deeply tied to our business function. And there's truly an expectation from our stakeholders um, that we are giving back to communities. And in fact, our, our business, our purpose statement is that we power uh, sustainable and active lifestyles for the betterment of people on the planet. And that we always like to think that the more that or the better we perform as a company, the more we can enact on our purpose as so sort of that improving our, our ROI, but enabling our purpose at the same time. I love that. That's a great way to state that. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else want to jump in there? You don't have to answer, by the way. I won't hold you to it. <laughs> not everyone, and not everyone has to answer every question. All right. Well, uh, moving ahead, then I think you know we when we kind of talked as a group prior to this panel, uh, we discussed you know some great examples of ways in which we've seen people be. And I hate this word successful because I think it looks and feels differently to everyone's success, especially in the social enterprise space. But we asked everyone, you know, what, give us an example of a company or a person that you have seen, and it could be yourself too, be successful um, in the social enterprise or social entrepreneur space and why you think that they ended up having that, whatever success looked like to them. And Jeannie, I think you had a great answer in some of your travels that you had shared with us. Sure, so I'll give one of those examples. I was just admiring everyone on the Zoom call today. There's so many amazing social entrepreneurs, so I'm really honored to be a part of this group today. Um, so one of our biggest initiatives is to help farmers around the world transform farms or plantations to sustainable agriculture practices, because a lot of our work is trying to minimize the impacts of climate change. And so we want to, put more soil in, or more, I'm sorry, more carbon in the ground than is going into the atmosphere is kind of the, the simplest way to put that. So as we are helping farmers and um, different uh, plantation owners engage in these practices, you know, there's kind of a risk to that. We, we don't know if there's truly going to be a, um, a return on investment or if they're going to be able to sell more cotton or more rubber um, based on what we're helping convince them to do. And so, so I think there's this risk component of it that's important to, to remember in, in our business. But once we get beyond that and really truly understand that, that there are multiple benefits to some of these, um, these, these projects that we're doing, and I'll just give you an example from Thailand. We are working on a, it's called a regenerative pilot project for rubber. So regenerative is really, again, sustainable agriculture practices um, where there's soil health improvement, but also there's this truly personal social um, benefit of improved um, economic diversity for the farm, improved health of the people who are working on the farm because there's more, there's more plants, there's more biodiversity, there's better soil quality, better water. And so it's, it's really been exciting to see these social entrepreneurs throughout our network of, um, of sourcing providers for our different commodities like rubber or cotton around the world and, and to really see them successful and not only do something really well for themselves financially, but really do something really, really exciting for the community and for those that work with them. Sorry about the dog barking. He's very <laughs> noisy. I'm very sorry. Um, and I'm, I am doing this from my home office. Um, Jeannie, I love that so much. And I, I love, I know I've heard that story before, but it resonated with me so much. And, you know, I think there is even more to that, that maybe you'll get into a little bit later in terms of how, um, you know, sort of the risk piece of it. We can talk about that, but I'd love to hear from other people on the panel who um, have any version of, of what they see as being a successful social enterprise. It doesn't have to be at the scale and the level that Jeannie just discussed, but any any version. Well, I'll give um, maybe some a bigger example that most people know, maybe um, the Warby Parker um, eyeglasses. And I love the story that it began with because, you know, when um, I believe the one of the founders, um, they were in grad school and um, he broke his glasses and he went, the glasses were so expensive that he went that semester without any eyeglasses. Um, and so he set off to making a, an eyeglass company that was stylish and affordable 
for, um, for everyone. And they use the Tom's model where they give um, eyeglasses to um, somebody in need. So I love that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of examples, like there's Naughty Thai, um, which is more local that, I mean, their mission was to create uh, meaningful employment for um, refugees. And they have been really, really successful and have moved, um, I think they have expanded from uh, the ties to, I guess, to face masks and to some um, other items. But it, again, it was, their mission was for refugees to come over and to have a position. So, um, I mean, there, there are so many good ones. I, mean, I, could, I could go on and on, but you know, those are some that I, I kind of love. Anyone else? No, I have one. Um, the uh, there's a gentleman named um, Sanjeet Bunker Roy. Bunker is his, I guess, nickname, and he had a really privileged upbringing in India. Um, and he, you know, would see sort of the contrasts between the other individuals in his country and in his town and how they lived off of typically less than a dollar a day. And so when he would um, visit some of these rural villages, he had this, you know, epiphany, which a lot of social entre entrepreneurs do, but sometimes it's, it's just kind of how they're built. Um, and he decided that he really wanted to dive into these social um, economic inequities in his country. And he founded Barefoot College. And this was in 1972. And it was a solar powered college for the poor. And Roy describes Barefoot College as the only college where the teacher is the learner and the learner is the teacher. And you'll have to look it up and read the story. It is a really fascinating story. And what's interesting to me is the time frame. You know, this that was 1972. And, and you know, even then, and I, I know that feels like not that long ago, but um, even then there were people out there who are just driven by change, who are really just, this is what they want to do. And, you know, he's a great example. And that's always something that resonates for me um, with these stories is that typically you see it in them, you know, at a very early age. And um, this, Nate, kind of made me think about you because I feel like you are young, which, you know, you shared with us. And, um, I, you know, I'm kind of interested in in hearing like when you were growing up, did you Sorry, that's awkward. Did you two give him a sec? He's he's in on this conversation. Did you really want to? He's so mean. He's trying to get in on this. Did you want to create change with us? Did you? I mean, with in general, did you? Were you really feeling like this is what I'm going to do as you were growing up? Um, yeah, I remember. When I was, um, I've been doing this interview project with um, this filmmaker, Rick Stevenson. Um, and uh, I've been getting interviewed hit by him once a year since I was 11. And I remember going back through some of my interviews and um, something that's always shined through is just like, I've always, like I said this when I was like, like 14, 15, I was just like, yeah, I just want to bring light into the world. I just want to use my voice to uplift people so like I've always um I don't know my parents and like mentors and like leaders from my church and like leaders from my school and they've always put like making a difference in people's lives into me so I want to that's something that I've always been interested in for sure love that um thank you for sharing that uh Alicia what about you is that do you think that I mean did you set out in sort of on this path and kind of know that this is the, that you were going to have to do something that created change? You know, as, as a former athlete and like ever, ever since I was little, I was always one of the few I'm uh, multiracial and going through private school. I was one of three children of color as a USAW athlete. I think I was one of like a handful of black female athletes. Um, and it's always, it, it never stuck out to me as being abnormal until it did. And then it kind of just, it, it hit me out of nowhere. I'm like, well, this, why are there so few of, of us or people that look like me? And um, it was just kind of something that just started 
slowly bothering me. And I actually think when my brother passed away, he passed away in 2011 and he was very much into, into the culture. Like he was full bore into his Hispanic heritage and like he embraced all cultures and all religions. And when he passed away, I kind of felt like that was left to me. And that that's really when I started um, just kind of my mission trying to normalize um, just a healthier way of living as a person of color. So like there are ways to include cultural food into your lifestyle and not have to go completely paleo or no, not have to cut out certain food groups that make your culture what it is. So I, I think it, um, no, I didn't grow up like that. I grew up in kind of a bubble. My, my parents were in the military. And then I think when I got into the real world, it just kind of, uh, the writing was on the wall. Like, hey, you're one of the few, but it doesn't have to be like that. So let's let's try to work to change it. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, anyone else have a story? Diane, I, I was going to ask you this too, because I actually don't know a lot about how Dope Mom Life started and, you know, sort of what your... Um, I know, I mean, I know the company, but I don't know the kind of origin story of it. And was it something that you always knew as a kid that you were going to do something like this? No. Um, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe. So um, Dope Mom Life originally started off as a mommy vlog. That's the reason for the name of the company. And then people are like, oh, we don't, we didn't know that that's the kind of work that you did. Um, do you work with moms? No, <laughs> not at all. Um, most of our clients are cities, states, city agencies, um, a large, a lot of bigger organizations and, and people tend to think whatever. Anyway, so Dope Mom Life started off as a mommy vlog with the intention of just being that representation for my community. And so um, much like I think a lot of, you know, Black Americans stories, um, when you grow up on the other side of resources, access and opportunities, you notice that you're one of very few. And so I grew up in Colorado Springs, born and raised on the north side, and I was one of few. One all the way through elementary to, um, to probably high school is when like my schools got diverse, but my dad lived on the south end of town. So I got to grow up and I got to see the differences in resources and access and opportunities based on whether the people looked like me or whether they didn't. And I also grew up having the code switch. So it took me a long time to get to a place where I just was like, I love who I am. I'm a product of both of those environments and that makes me beautifully me. Um, I wanted to go, so this is getting into the mommy vlog. So I wanted to go skydiving for my 31st birthday. And I had just quit my job in corporate America after dealing with racism and um, decided that that wasn't the life that I was meant to live. You weren't put here to work, to provide. Um, and none of my friends would go with me. So everybody was kind of like, Diane, Black people don't do that. And I was like, I mean, I'm Black and I'm doing it. And then after researching and understand historical the historical reasons why Black people don't access those spaces or weren't accessing those spaces was based on racism, redlining, oppression, fear of being murdered, lynched while you were trying to adventure, hunted, and a number of other things, right? So after understanding the historical reasons why our families just um, started saying like, we don't do those things, right? Instead of reliving the trauma, we just say we don't do those things. So first I just started Dope Mom Life um, essentially to be a mommy vlog and to be that example for my community that we could do those things. And then after, you know, I started a video production company at the same time, um, just because I was like, the video production company will create the content for my mommy vlog. A lot of people started reaching out to me to do video work so that they could look more diverse. But then I would go in and I seen this bigger problem within their organizations. And I was like, I'm not going to help you sell to my community members. Like you have to really internally be doing the work and not um, 
not be oppressive, not be racist, not, not traumatize the community members that you're asking me to help you engage with. And so I had to look at the bigger picture and what I was really doing this work for. And that was always to be that representation for my community. And so the company just has kind of grown from there with the intention of us helping organizations first understand how to engage with communities that they historically have not, um, don't know how to, and how to really serve them in a way that's culturally responsive and respectful based on community guidance and input. Um, yeah. So that. <laughs> so, I love all that. I can keep going. I'm like, tell me more. <laughs> I want more. Thank God I finally shut my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's great. That is, that's what I, I, I just love it. And it does, it's interesting because, um, you know, it's like, it's such an interesting comparison. You know, Jeannie's talking about stuff that's happening in other countries and what that looks like and sustainability and all that. And you're talking about things that are happening here. Um, Nate's also talking about sort of growing up and what that felt like and, you know, his vision for himself. And, um, you know, I think, again, like I keep going back to the idea of like, what is a social entrepreneur and what makes that person successful? And I think, you know, beyond just wanting to create change, I feel that you, it sounds like there is this, um, idea that you need to, it's not even just that you want to, but that you need to, because you see it and it's, you know, it's right there in front of you and someone has to do it. So why not? And I wonder, you know, if in saying that, that resonates with anyone, um, does it, it does Alicia jump in there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, I have four children. I have four Brown babies. I am pregnant with my fifth and we have to create a better world for them to grow up in. I mean, this isn't just about me being uh, an example of what health and wellness could look like. It's about making sure that they can do things and that they can go places and feel accepted. And I don't have to worry about them growing up in a bubble, right? I want them to be able to travel to the South and not feel com uncomfortable. I want them to be able to go skydiving and not have to worry about the trauma. So thank you for that, Diane. I mean, there's there's things that I, I'm still learning. I had no idea about the, the connection between past trauma and skydiving. So I'm actually gonna go look that up. I appreciate that tidbit of information, but it's really just making sure that you're, you're we're making an impact and trying to make a better world for our kids that have to kind of follow in our footsteps. Yeah, love that. Yeah, and Alicia, to your point, and, and really the historical racism is what kept us out of adventure spaces. So not specifically skydiving, but just adventure in general. Um, and then one last point I forgot to mention, I kept the name Dope Mom Life. So I always remember to go back to my why. I never lose sight of why I started doing this work. And which brings me to my point with Alicia, like I, I became a mom at 16 and my, you know, society was like, well, Statistics say that you'll have another one by this age, and I did that. And then statistics say you'll never be successful and you'll live on welfare and, and, and. And I was like, okay, well, I got to not be a super statistic. Um, and so I just got into a career field. Um, and then in looking at the world, I don't want to leave a world for my children where they're still fighting the fight that my dad fought and tells me about that my cousins were the first to integrate and they tell me and my those are my first cousins we share grandparents they were the first to integrate into white schools I don't want my kids to have to share those same stories with their children or fight the same fight um I think so it's that, not a choice then it's yeah. a yeah it's a must it's very interesting um Nathan, I guess you don't have a choice either. <laughs> um, I know you're, you're still in it. You're still on this journey as a young person. Um, not that the rest of us aren't, but um, I know that that you're kind of starting out so you don't have a choice either. And when I listened to your lyrics, I thought a lot about that because you know I know you've been on this journey um, with your art and your music. And um, yeah, so when you hear everyone speaking about this, is that what resonates for you? That this isn't a choice that you must do this or is there another piece that comes up? Um, yeah, I would say for sure. It's just like, it's easy to sit around and complain about things constantly. And um, I don't know, it doesn't get you any further not doing anything or not making 
some sort of statement or not like finding opportunities to be there for others as much as you need people to be there for you so um yeah i try to give back as much as people have been giving to me throughout this entire process nicole um i was thinking about you during this and wondering you know like was this something that um, you, going back to that same question, like, did you feel like you had a choice in this work? And if you did feel like you had a choice in it, you know, what did that look like? And, and how did you kind of decide to make the jump to be that impact investor and, you know, social entrepreneur in that way? I mean, I think it was always sort of ingrained in me when I was young, um, because I've been part of these family foundations for a very long time that um, does racial and economic justice issues and, um, you know, sort of dignity for all people. And um, so it wasn't a huge leap um, to uh, the kind of investments that I would be doing. So it's, it started off of, um, you know, I just wanted to, I thought it would, I started off just wanting to invest in diversifying my portfolio. And then I got a little bit deeper into it and realized I could actually create change by, um, by my investments. And um, so that's sort of how it happened. And then I even went down a little bit further and wanted to invest in women. And um, you know, now I'm looking at you know, guarantees and um, you know, investing my own money in a CDFIs. Um, we've had, uh, after seeing the success of the SAPA Foundation, where we gave um, we gave $100,000 to a CDFI called ACT, Albany's Coming Together in Southwest Georgia. And um, they were able to sort of turn, it was $100,000. It was a three-year, um, 0% loan. And they were able to turn that $100,000 into $1.5 million um, through other they were able to sort of leverage it in a way that they never were able to because the SAPA Foundation invested in and gave that PRI. So that was, that's a great success story. I'm not sure if everyone is going to be like that, but um, we're certainly, that's what we strive for. Um, and um, the, the um, act turns around and gives small loans um, based on, um, it's, it's basically trust banking. Um, to loans to people that can't get loans through the regular banking system. So to start sm um, small businesses in, in the community in the Southwest, um, Southwest Georgia area. So um, it's all like all of this, you know, every, every step I make is, a, is, a, is another step to something else. Um, and so it's really exciting. I love that. Thank you for sharing that journey a bit. Um, and, you know, it's interesting too, because it's a totally different sort of angle and perspective and equally as important. And you were clearly driven to do this. And the impact investing piece is just fascinating to me, just because I feel like there's just not, I know there's starting to be so much more out there, but there's just not a lot of information out there. And I think for social entrepreneurs, they don't even know that it's a, you know, sometimes I, I talk to people and I'm like, do you know about these things? Do you know about these different tools or these different options? And, and it's like, no, no, I had no. And these are sophisticated individuals who have researched and, you know, looked at different options for funding their business and thinking through, you know, what are their sort of funding um, strategies going to be? Um, so in with that, I guess um, I'm going to, I want to come back to that about the funding strategies, but um, Jeannie, you have such an interesting job too, as it relates to the environment and how you sort of, you know, tackle in these environmental and sustainable sustainability issues. I want to ask you the same question, which is, did you know that you were going to do this? Did this feel like a choice or do you feel like, you know, this just sort of is something that you were inspired to do at some point in your life? So um, I think it goes back to the first two social entrepreneurs that I knew. And one is my dad, who um, got very involved in solar energy at a young age and spent his whole life working on solar energy for the benefit of others. And so he um, spent a lot of time, he worked for an organization that allowed him to, to travel and, and teach others how to install rooftop solar and, and how to use that for the greater good. And it, he got into videography. Um, later in life, and he used to come home and, and show us these really cool 
uh, movies of where he would um, go to Tibet. So one really good example where there was zero electricity in this community. And then he would um, take a video from the very beginning of, of measuring the solar potential and working with the community to talk about how would they use the energy once they had it. And then to the day where they installed the solar panel and then it was for a community center. And then uh, this little child was able to turn on the light switch and the lights turned on and the, the whole community lit up literally <laughs> because it now they had access to electricity and so he went back over the years and was able to see um how they were able to diversify their their economy and and just really do more the education improved they were able to learn to read um and many many of the people that didn't have that opportunity before so that was just a, a nice way to kind of link environmental you know zero electricity let's not just start a new coal plant or bring in a fossil fuel let's use you know renewable energy and do something good um my mom was my other mentor and social entrepreneur and i get choked up because i lost her a couple of years ago and she was my my greatest mentor but um we lived in a, in a small town in eastern washington and it was very agriculture based and so nathan i did move to seattle eventually but i i grew up in in the tri-cities when i first um was in washington and my mom was a, a kindergarten teacher and she happened to be bilingual in Spanish. And so, um, because that's what she focused on in her schools. And, and so she was noticing that these four-year-olds and five-year-olds are coming to her classroom with muddy feet and, um, and falling asleep. And, and she's like, this is just not right. So she of course realized that these are the migrant families that um, were working in the fields before school. So she went to the local um, policymakers and was able to change the legislation in our town to, to, I guess, mandate that kids could not work in the fields before coming to school. And so that was one thing that she was able to do to really raise awareness around the importance of, of kids being able to go to school in the morning um, and not have to work. And then she took it a step further where she she truly listened to the, the, the kids in the room, to the parents and, and their best form of learning and established the first bilingual education program in our community and was able to get a grant eventually from the Gates Foundation and really expand this kind of bilingual learning, dual language learning, because we all know that you learn better in your own language. And so she really um, was able to transform the thinking around education and, and really thinking about the needs of those around us. Um, later, she moved to the other side of the state, um, closer to Seattle, and um, did the same thing in a school there where there was a lot of agriculture, more in the flowers and, and um, that part of the state. Um, but she was able to raise so much awareness that when she passed away, they um, not only um, raised enough money to to have enough um, resources for kindergarten, but they extended dual language to, her, to the entire elementary school. And that was really because she knows that, you know, that's it's giving everyone a gift to have an additional language, not only learning in your own language, but then to go through life with um, an extra tool in your in your toolbox. So um, that's really when I think about my own personal journey, my own personal purpose and that kind of dual environmental and, and social responsibility. That's really why I am who I am. I love that so much. That's that is a beautiful, beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. I didn't know that actually, and I know Jeannie pretty well. Um, so that I did know that a little bit about your dad, but not that in depth. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, this is wonderful. And, and I just want to say welcome. I know we have a bunch of new um, attendees that have jumped in. So thank you for joining us. And um, I hope you'll kind of stick around. We're having a, a really, I would say, heartfelt conversation about social entrepreneurship and what it means to be I, a successful social entrepreneur. And I think what I'm taking away so far is that there's a lot of different definitions of that. Um, but more than anything, I think coming into this with heart and wanting to create change and knowing that it's maybe not a choice um, is is uh, kind of at the, the, um, the heart of it all. So continuing on down this path, um, you know, I guess I would, I'm curious, you know, I, to me, I feel like when, when we work with clients, we often, I often feel this sort of weight um, when they come to us because it feels like it's risky enough being an entrepreneur. And then you add that sort of social entrepreneur piece to it where you're doing something to create change in this world, just like we just talked about where maybe it's not a choice and you feel that this has to be done, this work is necessary. Um, so that makes the venture even that much riskier. And you know, I think it's interesting because we have both 
we have, you all are, I would consider entrepreneurs um, on this panel, but we have people who are on the corporate side, who are on the funding side, who are, you know, own their own business and who are starting out. Um, and so, you know, I guess I would say like, you know, to the, ask all of you, the panelists to tell us, you know, the, the things that you think make it worth it. So what makes it worth it to take that risk? You know, the people that are listening, um, I'm guessing are here because they want to know, how do I do this? What, what is this going to be look like for me on this journey? And how am I going to survive? So what is it, what does it look like in terms of what advice would you give um, to someone starting down this road of social entrepreneurship? And, you know, what are the three things that you think are critical for them to keep at the forefront? I don't want to even say to have success. I just want to like, remind people that this is what's important. So I want to give you guys just a minute to kind of think about that. If you have that answer ready to go, jump in. And please base it in your own experience too. I'll just jump in and maybe I'll jump in afterwards, but just to get the, the ball rolling is, um, you know, I think that always remembering, I love um, how Diane mentioned that she kept the name Dope Mom Life because she always wanted to go back to it of why she started it. And um, I think that that is really important of really, you know, making sure that you don't get, you get caught in the moment of kind of following the money um, and sort of not going back to why you really started um, this company to begin with. And one thing that I, I do find when I, when I hear pitches is that, um, you know, you have, a, you have the mission of, of the company and yeah, you can make money, but sometimes people try to do both um, really, um, like they might start the company and wanna give 10% back. I think it's sometimes in my personal view, I think it's sometimes really better that you, um, just stay with the mission. And then when you're successful, give that, give that money back or, or um, you know, in the refugee um, in Naughty Thai that I'm talking about of just hiring refugees, that is, that was their mission. Um, so, and they, and they are making money, but I do find that sometimes um, their objective is really kind of washed out as, as they sort of get um, further along in the process. So just keeping a clear, clear message and clear objectives, I think is really key. Remembering your why, as Nathan just said to me that, because I used to tell him that a lot, but yes. And yeah. it's not my saying, I don't want to um, take Simon's next words, but yes, remembering that why, keep that at the forefront. I love that. Yeah. Anyone else? Come on. <laughs> right. Got to give these people some advice. Right. Um, I want to make sure I answer the question. So what are you looking for us to answer exactly? To, to give the people that are listening and to people who may listen at a later date, you know, what are the sort of things that you would tell them um, that are critical to, and I start, I stopped trying to use the word success, but critical to their journey as a social entrepreneur. Okay. Um, goodness. I think Nicole, Nicole definitely hit the nail on the head. I also add that, like, look at your skill set and and what you have to offer the what you have to offer the world, um, and build your business based off of that. I think and and understanding what the world needs. I know for me, it, I. I'm passionate about a lot of things and I do a lot of different things. Nicole is actually just telling, I work in philanthropy too. So I'm also on the other end and I am a funder. Um, and what I've, okay, let me get my thoughts together. What I've realized is that when you have a mission and you have a why, the money always comes. I think we, we get in this mindset of scarcity and lack um, and I can understand, you know, as a black woman, it's very easy to see that like, it's, it's hard to find funding <laughs> um, to sell your business and then don't name it dope mom life. <laughs> an extra <laughs> layer. Um, I mean, it's been a, a bless. It's been a blessing, never any curses, but 
like remembering um remembering your why and always and always going back to that and knowing that the money will come if you have a product and you're making sure that you're being of service to the community in a way that is impactful um, and keeping yourself happy the money is going to come that's really really good advice and i i truly believe that i think it's so hard to see that um to see that when you're in it and you're in the mix of it and it's not happening quickly or it's not happening on a day-to-day. Um, but the, the clients that we work with, at least I can say, the ones that have success are the ones that they do not veer from their mission, their why. They stay with it and they are just relentless. They do not, you know, and, it, and I know that can be exhausting and that can be hard and, you know, it's hard to wake up every day and push yourself. And sometimes it's probably like, you know, who, I mean, even to, for those of you who were on when um, Nathan opened for us with that amazing song, you know, it's like listening to his lyrics and listening to his words. It's like, it's hard. It's tiring. And like, am I doing the right thing? Is this the right thing? And why am I trying to create all this change if I can barely, you know, survive myself and I can barely sort of, you know, say that I'm quote unquote successful. So I guess, you know, I would totally um, piggyback on that, Diane, and just say like, just keep on like it is if you can. And if you can't like take a break and come back to it, because if it's truly something that you can't let go of, you're not going to be able to let it go. It's going to keep showing up for you over and over. And we've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs like that too, where it's shown up in one form, they couldn't make it happen. They had to move on. And then it's shown up again, and then it's shown up again, and then it's shown up again. And at some point it's going to stick. And I know that's easy for me to say, I'm sitting here and I, I, I can, you know, quickly be like, yeah, just make it work. But, but there is something about that tenacity that I think um, is very powerful. Alisa, you were shaking your head when I was saying that. Have you seen that happen? Well, I think just being a mother of four children and having to do all of the things that I have on my plate it is very easy, or it's not easy, but it's gonna happen that you reach a point where you're like, all right, I need to take a step back. I need to reevaluate, refocus, make sure that my vision is what I think it needs to be, and then move on. Like, it's very easy to just kind of get bogged down and wanna wash your hands of things. But it's, it's really, um, like you said, it comes down to tenacity. It's really just, be, when you hear the no's, like you're gonna hear a lot of no's. Like you, you, that's just the way that not everybody is going to give you money. Not everybody is going to believe in your mission and that's fine. But as long as you believe in it and you have a clear vision of what you're doing, eventually people will fall in line. Yeah. But I think it's, just, it's keeping that at the forefront of your mind. Yeah. And I would just say that, I mean, you know, I think that you always hear these stories about how people pitched, you know, 500 times before they got like their, you know, there, you know, a lot of, a lot of money, um, that somebody invested in them. Um, so it, it does take, you know, one no is not going or 10 no's should not deter you. And I would also just say that, especially for, um, minorities and people, uh, and women, um, is that only, a small percentage of, um, angel money and venture money goes to women. So, I say go and find that funding in different places. It is there. It just, um, you have to go searching a little harder than the normal places. I might just add, um, we have a foundation, FBF, and we, um, you know, we really think hard about how the, the dollars are distributed. And I encourage all of you to look at the website. We have our open spring grant cycle is coming up. So um, you can take a look and, and see if anything matches up. But you know, we, we want to um, you know, support those organizations or individuals that align with our business purpose and values. And so I think that's important. And I think I've heard the kind of the, the same kind of same thought around authenticity through this conversation. You know, stay authentic, stay true to your purpose. And then um, you know, we we really pay attention to you know, some of the, the real needs in, in the community. And so a lot of the dollars have gone out for environmental justice, social justice projects that have sort of that dual benefit of, of environmental and social benefits. Um, so I, there's a, there is a lot of um, really good funders out there that were a couple on the call today. And I think a lot of great ideas that um, 
we just it's a matter of finding the right match with those fundies and the and the grantees. Yeah, I was just going to co-sign what everybody was saying. Um, when your why is aligned, um, the dollars will eventually come. And um, everyone on this panel, like all these groups, they do really, really um, selfless work. And um, the who in all of that is really important as well. Just like if you're not, like when you're going into this work type thing, am I trying to serve myself or am I trying to serve my community or um, am I trying to serve my four or five my four or fifth kid coming on the way type thing like who am I trying to serve and who am I trying to be there for and just keeping that at the forefront as well and and just one point that I want to add being on on both ends of the work, like I said, being a funder and being an entrepreneur, um, I think there's opportunity in that too, and to see the challenges that the areas of opportunities for funders, for foundations, and how can you advance that work forward? Like I mentioned before, I work for an organist for a foundation called AJL, and you know, Dope Mom Life is full time. I have, I have a team, we're a team of seven. <laughs> we are full time. Um, I have to make sure all my people get paid. They depend on me to live. Not all of them, but, but majority of them. And I stay in the philanthropic world because I'm one of very few voices for our community and advancing this work. And it's not just on us to go out and seek. We have been denied access, resources, and opportunities. Um, and then especially being a Black woman, my ancestors built this country on their backs for free and then were denied at every single turn the opportunities to generate wealth in America. And it is also on funders to change how you fund, to open up those dollars and to make sure that we're doing the work in a way where we can where our communities can generate wealth and aren't depending on us to continue to fund them. Um, and so look for opportunities to get in there and make some changes on other ends where changes aren't being made. Yeah, I, Dan, that is um, a really good point. And I, I will just encourage panelists or panelists, attendees and people who are listening um, to make some noise too. You know, I, I've been in this space for a very long time and I've seen, I've seen dramatic change in the way things are funded, but not enough. And it is crazy to me to that that sitting here 21 years after I started my career in the social impact space that the funding space has barely changed you know there are certain places where you can see change but it is barely and it's I'd say like if you looked at a graph of the funding and the way that it's changed and it's not just the dollars and where the dollars are going it's about the attitudes it's about the pe way that people review grant applications or you know proposals or things like that um it is very sort of disheartening, but I think, you know, for anyone who's out there and um, is getting denied funding, you know, make some noise about it, you know, stand up and say, like, I want to know why I want to know the, the reasons why this wasn't, you know, accepted or you're not interested in, and push people to really make them make them consider what are, what is the reason and who knows what that is. I mean, it's different for every funder, but I just would say like to kind of, you know, parlay off of a Dan said, you know, stand up. Um, I do want to, you know, we're, we're, I have a few other questions, but I did want to open it up to um, the audience. We've, it's dwindled a little bit. And I want to just see if there's any questions that you all have. I realize stupidly, I put my number in the chat, but that was for tall of you. So the, <laughs> the YouTubers didn't get that. Um, but anyway, I, I want to kind of just open it up for a few minutes and see, are there any questions that you all have directed at the panelists that you want them to answer? And if not, that's okay too. Um, but yeah, just hit us up in that chat. I think it should be working. You should be able to do it. If not, let me know. I don't know how you'll do that though. Anyone, anyone can raise your hand too, I guess. I would also say that, um, you know, for entrepreneurs is um, finding a mentor is, um, is really important. I think getting it started, um, it can really help you figure, figure things out and um, not make a lot of mistakes that um, 
Well, it could save you a lot of time is really, and they also have great connections and they're a great resource. So that's also really um, just a, a little tip of finding a mentor would be really helpful for you. I have a quite while we're while we're waiting for other people if they have questions. I did have a question, um, which was around um, for those of you who have raised money, uh, what have you done to make that happen, and has it been successful, not successful? Um, what does that look like? And not even raise money, but I mean that could be in a small sense, like fundraising. Um, Alicia, I know you've done a couple of fundraisers and or at least community events, and I'm just kind of wondering, like, I guess beyond just the dollars, like, what have you done to build community around your ventures? How about that? I honestly think that um, my community has kind of grown from multiple different. Uh, aspects in the sense that I had a athlete community that kind of stuck with me. But then as my children got into schools and they, they met other people, um, the parents and I are kind of a community now. So I have uh, four kids in three different schools. That's three different communities that you kind of get to tap into. And there's a lot of like-minded people and there's a lot of resources in this area. So I think my ability to kind of lean into those communities and it's as um, it's a very diverse area in like the Northern Virginia DC space. And I say diverse, I mean like the culture, there's a lot of culture there. There's a lot of um, just different colors that you see in the school and it's really awesome. But it also, um, it makes for a great audience. A lot of people want to help, but they really don't know how. And I'm like, well, hey, come see me and <laughs> we can get some things going. So I think it's really just kind of tapping into those resources and the networks and, and really on LinkedIn and social media. And it's, it's easy to kind of crowdfund. Um, and I say crowdfund, I mean, like, we're, we're not talking big dollars here, but enough to kind of keep uh, my nonprofit flowing along, but it's, it's, um, it's definitely that battle of asking people for money. You're like, it feels kind of gross, but, um, you know, that it's going <laughs> for, it's for a good reason. It's not like I'm, I'm asking you for money so I can go shopping. It's really <laughs> let's, I want some money so we can go do some good work. Right. So I think it's just kind of leaning into those and getting past that uncomfortableness of raising the money. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Jane, were you going to say something? Yeah. Okay. I thought I saw you unmute. That's why. <laughs> it was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been, so, I've become so attuned to the unmute and the mute over the last 18 months that I'm like, I'm so hyper aware. Um, yes, that, that is really, it is hard to ask. It's really hard to ask. And it's, you know, I think you make a point of like, if you don't have a community to go to, to say, hey, you know, will you support this? You know, where do you turn to? And, you know, I would say that there are some amazing, amazing resources online. And something that we sometimes will steer our clients to is, and this is going to sound a little hokey, but there are all these wonderful Facebook groups out there that um, are, pro you could probably find a Facebook group that aligns with what you're passionate about or what you're trying to start or what you need support with. And I don't mean in terms of people, you know, dedicating their resources, although that might be, I mean, their human resources, although that might be part of it. Um, but I think you could go in there and, you know, make friends and, and kind of check the pulse and, and see what the conversation is that's happening. And if there's an appropriate time, you know, invite them to something or ask, you know, if someone can jump on a call and kind of lean into if you don't feel like you have that community that will support you in a certain way at a certain level, you know, go online, utilize the resources and the tools that we have available to us right now. Actually, do you have something to add? <laughs> um, so I did, I did, I did do a raise and it kind of, it, I got, I got invested in last year, which was 2020. And we all know what that, what that life was. And, and a lot of money went to social justice um, work and people were trying to change how they were doing things. But what I will say is the reason that the organization that I ended up going through to get funded, the reason why they reached out to me is because I was constantly showing up 
in their spaces and in their in, in, in their faces before they we got to 2020. So they knew my name and they were like, oh, let's reach out to Diane. Um, and we have to make sure that Don't Mom Life is here. Um, and so I will say show up, even if it's uncomfortable. I always say every room that we're in, we're supposed to be in. Um, you deserve to be there. You have something that is valuable. And so show up. And then I found out, like, as far as community building, um, and this is really what has been my, my sales process. <laughs> I hope my COO is not watching this. <laughs> Mike, I'm joking if you are. Um, what has really been my sales process <laughs> was just was building relationships. And so I figured out who my target client was. Like I, like I can see them whenever I walk into a room, I know what they look like. I know how they dress. I know what kind of heels they wear. It's usually women. (laughs) Um, And those are the spaces that I go and network and I build my communities um, and I build my, one of my many communities in that space. And so I joined networking groups that I thought I would never join. I volunteer in spaces I never thought I would volunteer in. I do, but also I have fun. I don't just do it just to do it, but like it is also very strategic and intentional with like understanding the work that we're doing and and who is our target client and who will champion us in rooms that we're not in um, and who will speak our names in a room full of opportunities. And so um, what were the spaces and faces you showed up at meetups, conferences? Yeah, like I, I did some networking, uh, not networking groups, um, leadership programs, but I was intentional about what those were and who the people that would be in those leadership programs were. My goal was to better understand myself as a leader and to also meet other leaders that I think like um, Nicole said would... Um, would mentor me, would would help me if I needed marketing help, which I'm not like an expert marketer or, or a CPA and stuff like that. So um, are you able to see the chat, Diane? I can. Can you all? I can't see it. Oh, uh, open it up. Uh, <laughs> I'll read the question though if you want it. <laughs> I lost it. So any are, were there any other questions in there? Yeah, so question um, from YouTube, social entrepreneurs, what are your favorite podcasts to listen to? Oh, and I will say How I Built This is one of my favorites. Oh yeah, that's an amazing one. Anyone else? Clubhouse, Alicia says, now I can see it, although I think that's only from the panelists. Clubhouse is amazing. If I'm, a, I'm hoping that everybody is on Clubhouse. If you're not on Clubhouse and you're a social entrepreneur, you need to get on Clubhouse. Um, it's, it's a hard platform to navigate, but it has amazing resources um, and conversation that is happening in the social change space. There's also a lot of nonsense too. You got to filter through. Anyone else? Jeannie, what are some of your favorite podcasts or even books while we're at it? My books are kind of wonky environmental side, but I love Clubhouse. We actually have a lot of our um, in-house social entrepreneurs um, uh, spend time there. And it's amazing the the people that you meet and just the the ideas that can be shared. So I was actually going to say Clubhouse as well. Oh, nice. Uh, Nate, what about you? I mean, social entrepreneur podcast, I don't really have that. What about just podcasts? Just true crime. (laughs) Who am I listening to? Uh, You know, I just listen to a lot of sports radio. What music are you listening to right now? Currently, there's this artist named Thames from uh, Nigeria. She is amazing. All right, write it all down, people. Is she similar to you in her poetic nature about social change? Uh, she has a few songs for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, have people like artists doing it, doing a lot in the social change uh, aspect. Um, there's this artist from over here. Her name is Tezza Talks and she makes really, really incredible music. Love it. Tezza Talks, I have to write all these down. 
Yeah, look at everyone's right. All the panelists are writing down. <laughs> Nicole, do you have any? Gosh, I mean, I really, um, I listen to more of my news on my podcast, but Vox um, has some, is a great podcast. And I actually listened to Barbara Corcoran, is that her name? From, yeah, yeah. Um, from Shark Tank. She does these like little 20 minute segments of what works and what doesn't. And I, some of them are really interesting. I like the one when she interviews um, Mr. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> I would like that. But too, yeah, I mean, some of them are like 10 minutes, five minutes, others are an hour. So um, okay. they're, they're, they're sort of interesting of what works, what doesn't. I have a couple, um, Adam Grant, Prof G, um, what else? Uh, oh, I'm forgetting the name. Let me see if I can find, oh, Purpose 360, it's, um, she's another, she kind of is the pioneer of social impact. She's an incredible human being, Carol Cohn. Um, so for those of you who want these kind of like tips and tricks on how people have done this, there was one recently that was just like, I couldn't, I was like, this is, it's so good. It was, um, uh, oh, the Founders Pledge. Uh, the guy, the co-founder, David Goldberg, who started the Founders Pledge. So that was a really good one. And um, I'm, there's more too. I can send out, if DSW allows me, we can send out, we can kind of curate a list and send those out to all of you. Um, the, uh, three, uh, Purpose 360, the one I was just talking about, had one. I haven't listened to it yet. I have it queued up. It's called, Hey Google, What's Your Purpose? Um, and it's all about Google.org's focus on humanity's biggest challenges. And so they're kind of talking about sort of what Google's doing to help in that realm. Um, and there, were there any other questions in the chat that I can't see? No? Okay. Um, so as we kind of start to wrap things up here, um, I guess I want to ask you all, I mean, one of the biggest things that I struggle with and, and being a marketer of social entrepreneurs, um, I struggle a lot with the idea that, and sometimes when a client comes in, I wanna know, are they doing it for um, the right reasons? Are they doing it for, for marketing? Like, is it a marketing play or is it, is it genuine? Is it real? And so, um, you know, it's been, it's been a, it's been hard for me to have that framework because we only will work, we, we try, we only work with people who are on this kind of mission driven path. And so we really want to make sure we're a good fit for them. And I'm wondering to all the panelists, this is a long tee up, um, but you know, how would you stand out in this crazy world where it appears that everyone is doing something good? I mean, when you look on Instagram, it's, it's kind of funny. Like, I don't, think I have anyone who's not doing something good. So how do you stand, how do you suggest people stand out um, and be seen in an authentic way that, um, you know, resonates with community and really helps them move forward as social entrepreneurs? I would say co-sign everybody that you see doing go good work type thing. And uh, Strat Labs does a good job of that. Like, but, um, if you see somebody else doing good work, like, I don't know, hip hip hooray, throw it on your Instagram story. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a good, um, that's a good way to think about it. I've never thought about it in that way that, you know, sharing this content as a, if it's really good and we see it as being really good, you know, getting it out there. We do it with our clients, but X, you know, beyond that, I feel like it could go a little further. That's a hard one because I, I, I feel like I'm kind of stepping back from social media because it's starting to just get really noisy and full of, I, I'm tired of being sold. If that's, if that kind of makes sense, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of people out there that are, that are just making noise. So I've really kind of pulled back from social media, but I'm trying to kind of figure out how do I still continue to almost be seen or even just kind of, um, uh, how, how are people going to know that we're actually trying to do good work? But then it hit me. I was like, I really don't care if people know, <laughs> which is good and bad because uh, I guess uh, the companies will only fund those that have this, this big aura and this big persona. 
but I'm like, I don't care. Like, I'm not doing this for notoriety. I'm always, I'm doing it because it's, it's what we want to do. It's a part of our family core value. And I think at some point, like, you just have to be okay with that. Like, if you're not, you may not get the notoriety that you want to see. And like, that can't deter you from continuing to do the good work. So I think it's definitely, it's definitely a balance. If you're not going viral, does it really matter? Yes, it still matters. I love that. That's such a good reminder. Cause I, I can't tell you the number of people who come in and they're like, we want, we, you need to make us an influencer. You need to, you know, raise our profile and get us out there more and speaking and impress and all that. And we want to, we, of course, like that, we, that's our, it's our whole sort of, you know, we, we've built a platform around like helping to amplify voices, but, but sometimes we get so caught up in it that we forget, like, does it even really matter? You're still doing really good work. So that's a good reminder for me. I need to put that like on my wall over here. Um, Jeannie, how does VF kind of stay so, you know, being such a large corporation and having so many brands under this umbrella, I would think it would get really hard to stay true to this purpose that you all have defined. What are the sort of the ways in which you do it at this higher level? Yeah, so at the, at the top level, you know, we really kind of stay true to our purpose. And, and I mentioned that a couple of times with the betterment of people on the planet, but at the brand level, um, you know, we, each brand has their opportunity to kind of express themselves in their own way. And I think Vans is probably the, one of the best known for really allowing people to ex express their themselves through art, through, um, through skateboarding, through, through surfing. And one example um, I'll just say is that during the pandemic, when a lot of the skate shops were shutting down and there was a lot of just social unrest in, in cities where our stores were located. Um, we really stepped up and, and supported a lot of, um, of skateboard shop owners to, to continue to stay in business um, through, you know, just requests for funds or setting up different um, uh, op options on our websites to every time you purchase a pair of vans, a percentage is going to support the skate shop or to support an artist. And so there's, there's, we've found some creative ways to really support those communities through the personalities of our brands. Um, so I think, again, Vans is a really good example of that. Yeah, I love that. That's great. I love Vans. And I, can I say one more thing just while I, I have the floor? I just wanted to say that one of my, my favorite social entrepreneurs is on the call today. We haven't really got to hear much of your story, Lizzie, but um, I'm lucky enough to be in the same um, elementary school community as Lizzie. That's our connection. Our my son is in the same grade as, as Lizzie's oldest son, and um, I've watched Lizzie really create excitement and passion around raising money for our school. And I think it really starts with connecting with the community, having passion, being authentic, and um, and really rallying everyone for for the same you know same idea and, and passion to get everyone excited about it. So I, I really want to recognize the work that you've done and. Thank you for bringing us all together today. Thank you. I like the reference to Asbury. <laughs> um, I also make a lot of noise at the school when things are unjust. Um, yes. So, um, but it, yes, thank you, Jean. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the recognition. I, you guys can't see it, but this dog has been trying to get in my lap the entire time that I've been on this panel. <laughs> He's just like, well, I, I want to be on camera. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he made it in the last few minutes. Um, well, anyway, I, this is, I don't know if there's any, have there been any other comments in the chat? Christine is a, on our team at Strat Labs and she is here and she's been monitoring the chat. Um, although I'm sure she's exhausted from an insane week that we had with our clients, but um, I appreciate it, Christine. Thank you for being here and for doing that. I pinged you at the last minute. Was there anyone else that had a question? And thank you so much to the interpreters. I mean, it's such a beautiful, it's so beautiful to watch. It's so incredible how you all are able to, to take our words and, and put them into language. I, I'm fascinated by it. So I appreciate you being here as well. I love that Denver Startup Week has prioritized that and made that something that is important to the community. So thank you for doing that. Um, and Nathan, thank you for, for singing and sharing and, and being vulnerable with us and giving us, sharing your voice and your words. Um, they're always powerful and poetic and meaningful. And I appreciate you starting us off with that. 
Um, and to the to the panelists as a group, I'm really so happy to have had this time with you. Um, I think you all are just incredible human beings, which is why I asked you to do this with me. Um, I do think of all of you in different ways as, as successful entrepreneurs, um, social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. Um, and I've, I've followed each of your journeys and um, it was a genuine request when I asked you to be on this panel to help share that story um, because I know that you all come from different angles and um, I wanted that perspective for everyone. So thank you so much for doing that and for taking that time. And um, I don't, again, I don't know what Denver Startup Weeks, um, how we do follow up, but if we can, we'll include all of your handles in there so that people can see, um, connect with each of the panelists. If you all have access to the chat, which I don't, you could stick it in the chat right now um, and we'll get it to the rest of the people that were there, your handles for ways people can connect with you if you want them to. And um, yeah, so if you need anything from our team, Strat Labs, you can always find us on, on uh, social media or you can reach out to me um, at lizzie at stratlabs.us. And other than that, if there's nothing else, I think we, uh, we can wrap it up. And DSW thank you, thank you, way. Lizzie. Oh, oh, sorry, Diane, what'd you say? We do have a way to connect anybody okay. that wants to be connected. Um, that was a panelist, so yeah. Thank you. Um, again, thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, and I hope to see you all next year at Denver Startup Week or before. Thank Bye. you, Lizzie. Bye.